Good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Hope everyone's had a good day today. I want to begin our study this evening by looking at a passage that I'm sure is going to be familiar to most of us. It comes from Matthew chapter 3. And notice with me the first six verses. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Now I want you to skip down and let's pick up our reading in verse 13 of that same chapter. We're going to read down through verses 17. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here in Randolph County, we pride ourselves on being a county that within its boundaries has five rivers flowing through it. And each one of these rivers, the Black, Current, Foshi, Eleven Point, and Spring, are known for a variety of different characteristics, and they all contribute to our county in a variety of different ways. But without question, the most famous river in the world is not one of these five. The most famous river in the world is the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan is not famous it's not well known due to its length or its width, as we might think of, say, the Mississippi River or the Amazon River. In fact, the entire Jordan River, as the crow flies, is only about 100 miles long. It is seldom more than 100 feet wide, and very rarely is it more than 10 feet deep. It is a small river. Also, it's not well known due to the amount of commerce that travels upon its waters. You know, we travel to Memphis and oftentimes as we go across the Mississippi, we'll see those great barges that are plying the waters, carrying that commerce up and down the river. Well, due to the size of the Jordan being so small and due to the fact that it is a shallow river, there's no commercial boat traffic that travels the waters of the Jordan River. Also, the Jordan is not famous because of large cities that's built upon its banks, as we might think of rivers like the Tiber or the Seine or the Thames that we read about in the, the, great, Egypt, or the great European cities. You know there's not a single city that's located on the Jordan River? Not a single city. So that's not what it's famous for. It's not famous due to great flooding. You know, we read about the great floods along the Nile River in Egypt and the great deposits of topsoil that it brings to the farmland every year, replenishing the nutrients. No, the Jordan's not really known for that either. So why is the Jordan River so famous? Why do we say that the Jordan River is the most famous river, the most well-known river 
in all the world. Well, tonight we're going to notice three things that lend to the fame of this river. First, we're going to notice some peculiar physical characteristics. We're going to talk geography for just a little while tonight. But we're also going to talk about some historical events, things that took place near to and even within the waters of the Jordan. And lastly, we're going to talk about its association with God's people. But as we begin this study tonight, I want to mention that much of the historical and geographical information that's going to be included in this lesson tonight, I have to give credit to a couple of brothers. Uh, Brother J.W. McGarvey in his book, Lands of the Bible, goes into great detail talking about the Jordan River, but also Brother Jerry Dickinson uh, has a lesson online where he talks about the Jordan River and So much great information has been chronicled by these two brothers that will contribute to some of the information that we look at tonight. But first I want to notice some of the peculiar characteristics of the Jordan River that really sets it apart from every other river that we see on earth. Every other river on earth. 100% every other river has as its source either a glacier in the mountain somewhere or a spring that comes forth at an elevated location. That river then flows in a steady downward direction, taking the path of least resistance until it reaches sea level, ultimately at the level of the ocean. Well, the Jordan River... It begins at a spring. The source of that spring has been traced back to melting uh, glacier water back up in the hills around the Jordan region. But this spring is only located just a few feet above sea level. This is something that no other river can claim, that its source is that close to the level of the sea. But then as it leaves this spring, it travels just a few hundred yards. And it enters into a lake, which we first read about in Joshua chapter 11 and verse 5, that Joshua refers to as the waters of Merom. And the waters of Merim are now known as Lake Hula. Lake Hula is where the Jordan River really starts to become unique, where it really starts taking on these different characteristics. And it's because Lake Hula lies at sea level. It lies at zero degrees. Well, when the Jordan flows out of the south end of Lake Hula, It flows ten and a half miles until it enters into a more famous body of water, the Sea of Galilee. In that ten and a half miles, the Jordan has dropped from zero degrees, from sea level, down to 680 feet below sea level. The Sea of Galilee is actually below the level of the sea. Now the Sea of Galilee, of course, we know is very, very important to many events that we read about, especially in the life of Christ. But when the Jordan flows out of the south end of the Sea of Galilee, as I said, it's already 680 feet below sea level. It then travels in what we might best refer to as a serpentine pattern. It's never straight. In fact, Brother Dickinson's lesson, he refers to as, why is the Jordan River so crooked? There is not more than 100 yards of straightness anywhere between the Sea of Galilee and its outlet at the Dead Sea. It is constantly moving. Constantly going back and forth. 
As the crow flies from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea is less than 70 miles, but by river it is over 200 miles because of all the twists and the turns that it takes along its course. But now, remember I said that whenever it leaves the Sea of Galilee, and I promise we're going to leave geography behind here in a minute and get into a Bible lesson. But when it leaves the Sea of Galilee, it's at 680 feet below sea level. And by the time that it reaches the Dead Sea, it is now 1,300 feet below sea level. 1,300 feet. Uniquely, the Jordan Valley, the river itself, and its outlet, the Dead Sea, all hold the distinction of being the lowest places on earth. The lowest elevations below sea level on earth. But then we think about the Dead Sea. The Jordan flows into the Dead Sea, but what happens then? There's no outlet. The Jordan never comes forth again from the Dead Sea. We might say that the Dead Sea is the dead end of the Jordan River. But when it flows into the Dead Sea, we find that this water, and no one's really able to give a good, clear answer for this, has a salinity level, the saltiness of that water. And remember, this is fresh water that's flowing into this lake. There's no outlet to the ocean. The Jordan River is what is feeding the Dead Sea, and that is fresh water. But the salt level of the Dead Sea is about three times saltier than the ocean. Brother McGarvey said in his book that whenever he traveled to the lands of the Bible, as he referred to it, he said that his guide took him to the shore of the Dead Sea and took out an egg. And he laid that egg on the waters and said it rested upon the top. Said that water was so dense due to the salinity of that water that none of that egg would actually go under the surface of that water. He also went into great detail talking about people that he witnessed out floating upon those waters and how they would intentionally try to dive under the waters. But the water was so thick that they would just constantly come right back up to the surface. So you can see the Jordan has many unique characteristics. Many things can be said about this river and the region round about it that cannot be said about any other body of water on earth. But now let's think about some of the historic characteristics, some of the historic events that have transpired in connection with the Jordan, and I believe this lends much more significance to the fame of this river. In fact, it was not until 1848 that an American team led by a man named W.F. Lynch was the first ones to actually go and map out the Jordan River. They went along its course. They traveled by boat as much as possible. They traveled on foot much of the way when they couldn't travel by boat. And they took soundings and they took depths along the way and they measured the width and everything of this river. And most of that information was not known before 1848. Well, we know that the Jordan River has been well known, has been very famous for much longer than just the last, say, 250 years. So it wasn't these unique characteristics that makes this river so famous. Now, yes, it contributes to it today since we have this knowledge, but that's not what makes this the most famous river in the world. So let's turn to some of the historical things that took place along this river. If we go all the way back to Numbers chapter 22, 
In Numbers chapter 22, Moses has led the children of Israel as they've wandered through the wilderness for 40 years. At the end of that 40-year period, he leads them down into the Jordan Valley to a location which most agree was probably just upriver from its confluence with the Dead Sea. Now, mind you, that is up to speculation, but there, there's some evidence there that says that this is probably the case, probably the location where this happened. The Bible tells us that it was in the plains of Moab. The plains of Moab are still known of today. Their location is still known today. You can still go and visit the plains of Moab. And these plains are roughly seven miles wide and eight miles long. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not a very large geographical area. But this is the area where the children of Israel come and they make their final camp in the wilderness. Their final camp before crossing over into the promised land. Now these plains of Moab... This was a popular place, and more than likely the reason why it was chosen was because it was a well-watered area. There were a number of springs there that, uh, that fed that area, that caused the grasses to grow much thicker in that area. Remember, this is generally a, a desert area. This would be seen somewhat like an oasis where they would come and where they would be able to provide for their animals. But this was a place that would have provided sufficient water, sufficient nourishment for this large Israelite nation. Moses was told in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 49 through 51. They are there, they're camped here, they're on the plains of Moab. This last encampment before entering into the promised land. And it was from this location that Moses was told... Get up from this place and go into the mountains. Get thee up into the mountain of Abarim, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho. And behold, the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. And die in the mount whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hor, and was gathered unto his people." Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. So Moses was told, he said, from this place, from this encampment, now I can imagine that the people were probably pretty excited at this point. They've finished this 40-year period. This new generation has come up. They're now there. They're in the Jordan Valley. They're right there along the river. They can look across and they can see the promised land. And God comes to Moses and says, Moses, don't go across the river. Go up into the mountains. Go into the mountains of Moab. Go to the tallest peak, Mount Nebo. He says, there, I'm going to let you go, and I'm going to let you look out. I'm going to let you look across the Jordan, and you can see this promised land that you've been leading the people to. He said, but while you're up on that mountain, you're going to die. And the reason that you're going to die is because you sinned against me. You didn't glorify me. And we remember the story of where he was told to speak to the rock and water would come forth. Well, rather than that, he commanded the rock to come forth and then he struck the rock, making it as if he was the one that was bringing that about rather than God. God said, you didn't glorify me. He says, therefore, you're going to die on this mountain. Now, here you have Moses, a man of 120 years of age. A man that Deuteronomy 34 and verse 7 says that his eye still had not dimmed and that he still had his natural strength. The text said his natural force had not abated. He was just as strong at 120 as he was at 20. God had preserved his strength. 
He was just as strong and just as healthy as he had ever been. So he climbs up on this mountain. From that peak, he's able to look out. He's able to see the promised land, but he's also able to look down and see the plains of Moab. He's able to see all of these people that he's led for all these years. I'm sure that this was a very solemn moment for Moses. Realizing that he had come that far. But that was as far as he was going to get to go. Well, after Moses had an opportunity to stand there, to look out, to witness everything that was before him, he fulfilled God's purpose for his life. And Moses died. And the Bible tells us that he was buried by God and his burial site remains unknown. God buried this great man of faith and no one knows where that location was. Well, after 30 days of mourning, the children of Israel, they know that Moses has gone to the mountain to die and they spend 30 days mourning over their fallen leader. And at that point, the leadership of the nation falls upon a man named Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua in Joshua 3 and verse 2, Tell the people to prepare food, because in three days you shall pass over the Jordan. So he says, Joshua, you go and you tell the people to get ready. Tell them to prepare food to get everything prepared, because in three days you're going into the promised land. Now the text also goes on to say that due to the time of year that the Jordan was in flood stage, that the Jordan had filled its banks and that it had even overflowed its banks. And I'm sure that there were some of those who were camped there who were looking out at the Jordan, who were seeing all of these flood waters and wondering how exactly are we going to get across How exactly are we going to do this? You know, they didn't have the conveniences that we have today. They didn't have bridges. They didn't have the the kinds of boats and things that we have where they could ferry people across. They were on foot. And yes, while the Jordan River, as I said, is seldom more than 10 feet deep when it's at its normal average depth. It's now in flood stage. Its banks are filled. It's overflowing. But nevertheless, on the third day, when the people were told to rise, they did as they were told. They didn't murmur against Joshua. They didn't question what was going to take place. They got themselves up and they walked down to the river's edge. But when they got to the river's edge, the priests were told to go at the head of the company. And the second that the priests' feet touched the water, suddenly the waters of the Jordan parted. They went back. Now, this was not just a small, narrow passage. And I think probably all of us, and I have as well, have had this mentality in the past of thinking about, you know, the parting of the Red Sea, the parting of the Jordan, that this would not have been a a large area, that this would have been a fairly small passage that they would have gone through. Well, the text actually tells us how large it was. Joshua 3 and verse 16 tells us that this flooded, swollen, overflowing river parted for a distance of somewhere between 16 and 18 miles. Imagine that. 16 to 18 miles. But notice, not only did it part, the text tells us that just like with the parting of the Red Sea, it became dry. Completely dry. 
How long does it take ground to dry after it's been underwater for a while? Quite a while, doesn't it? Immediately. 16 to 18 miles of this swollen river go completely dry. Being held back by the power of God. Well, approximately 3 million people cross the Jordan River at that time. That's how large the Israelite nation was at that time. About 3 million people cross that river on dry ground. And when the last person had stepped onto the other side of the Jordan, and the priests, they were standing there the whole time. Because as long as they were standing there, the waters were going to be held back. And as soon as the priest stepped out of that dry riverbed onto the riverbank, the waters closed back in. God displayed his power by way of the Jordan River. God again showed his power to his chosen nation in an attempt to once again get them to trust him, to follow him. Well, God had already told Joshua that he was about to prove to the people that Joshua was the chosen leader. I'm sure that there were probably some when Moses died that wondered, well, who's going to step up? Who's going to be the new leader? Well, God says, Joshua, I'm going to prove to the people once and for all that you're the one that I have chosen. Well, what greater way to prove this? than by this great miracle. When the people did what Joshua told them to do, this river parted in a miraculous way. This miracle at the Jordan, you know, people have tried for many, many years to try to explain this away. Some have tried to say, well, it must have been during the dry season and the river must have actually just dried up on its own. Well, no, the Bible tells us it was during the wet season that the river was flooded. Others have said, well, there must have been some type of an earthquake. You know, we probably all remember from history lessons about how during the New Madrid earthquake that the Mississippi River actually flowed backwards for a while. Well, it must have been something like that. You know, it, there must have been some kind of an earthquake that caused this to happen. No. It was the people doing what their leader told them to do. The power of God forced those waters back. Now, folks, this is only one of many historical events recorded in God's Word that took place around the Jordan River. I wish we could talk about many more because there's so many that lend itself to the fame of this river. So many amazing accounts that we read about, especially in the Old Testament, that deal with the Jordan River. But our time's getting short, and I want us to deal with our last point. And that is the Jordan River's connection to God's people. Both during the Old Testament, with God's chosen nation, the Jews, and in the New Testament, with Christians, the Jordan has held significance. The Jordan has long had an association with Christians. How many songs in our book do we sing that talk about the Jordan? On Jordan's stormy bank I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. We sing about that we're camping in Canaan's land and how it's along the banks of the Jordan. When we sing these great words, we picture ourselves as if we're there. We picture ourselves as if we are one of those Israelites standing there gazingly, gazing longingly across that river. We picture ourselves as if we're Moses standing there upon that mountain looking out and seeing the glory of that land. Well, how does that compare to us? 
I want to share a statement with you from Brother McGarvey that I think is so beautiful. He said, every man, when he sings these words, imagines himself standing on the brink of that dark river, separating us from our promised land, that heavenly land. Every man, when he hears this song, looks over to the hills of the earthly Canaan, and at the same time gazes upon the blooming fields of the everlasting paradise of God. The Israelites were gazing across the Jordan to their promised land. And in a sense, we are gazing across the Jordan to our promised land. We are looking and longing for heaven. Oftentimes, we hear people when they talk about someone that has passed away. And this is something we don't really hear much anymore, but they used to talk about that they've crossed over Jordan. They've crossed over into that promised land. You know, there's a song that we really don't hear sung much anymore that talks about, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Talks about how when we pass away, you know, even, even the story of the rich man and Lazarus talks about that the angels will come and will carry our soul away. We won't have to cross over that barrier and that's essentially what we see here with the Jordan. The Jordan was the barrier between the wilderness and the promised land. Death is the barrier between this life and our eternal life. But why is there this connection, this association between Canaan and heaven? Crossing the Jordan and death. Because think with me for just a moment. The children of Israel have just endured 40 years of death. An entire generation of people died in the wilderness for 40 years. They saw their loved ones pass away, never reaching that point of obtaining that promised land. And now, 40 years later, Canaan's land is in sight. That promised land is right there, just across that river. But they had that last barrier that they had to cross. Folks, as we go through this life, living life as a Christian each and every day, essentially we are walking through the wilderness of this life. Each day, we see those around us who refuse to come to the Lord, who refuse to do His will, passing from this life in an unsaved condition. But each and every day, we know that as we strive to do the Lord's will, we're getting that much closer to that promised land. That much closer to heaven being our home. And even though heaven is in sight, even though we are able with an eye of faith to essentially look into the future and say, I know that heaven is going to be my home, there's still a barrier there. We cannot enter into that place while we are still alive in this body. The children of Israel could not enter into that place while they were still living in rebellion. They could not enter into that place while they were still being led by a man who essentially had been rejected by God. Moses was the last of that generation, so to speak, that had to die in the wilderness before that next generation of leadership could step in could lead them into that promised land. We have to lay the things of this life aside. If one day we want to cross over our Jordan and enter into our heavenly home, then we have to lay aside the things of this life. And we have to live a life of faithful service to God. But also, something else that I want us to think about just as the children of Israel stepped up to the riverbank and God 
took away their fears, took away their dread by parting those waters. We see that God has removed the fear and the dread of death for the Christian. No, it's not necessarily something that we're ready to go through today. But it's something that we're prepared for if today is the day. We're not afraid of it. There's not a dread there. Because we know what lies ahead. God has provided that for us. But in order for this fear of death to be removed, we must follow our divinely appointed leader. Just as the children of Israel had to follow Joshua. If they hadn't done what Joshua had commanded them to do, I'm convinced that the Jordan River would not have parted. Many of those people probably would have lost their lives trying to cross over that swollen river. But when they did what their divinely chosen leader told them to do, God provided a way. So to speak, he brought them salvation. He brought them through those waters. Well, who is our divinely chosen leader today? It's Jesus. And what did Jesus do as an example for us? Well, he went to the literal Jordan. He told John that he had come there not because he was sinful, not because like you and I, we need to be washed clean from our sins. He went there because he was told this is to fulfill all righteousness. This is what is expected of man. And if I'm going to be that ultimate example, then this is what I have to do as well. If we're going to follow our divinely chosen leader, then we have to follow the pattern that he set forth for us. We have to enter into the waters of baptism. And just as God, from that point forward, remember we're told that the heavens opened, we heard the voice of God, we saw the Holy Spirit descending as a dove, all three members of the Godhead were present on that occasion. God never left Jesus' side. He was always with him. This is why when Jesus was hanging there on the cross, even though he was in tremendous pain and agony, when we get to the point where it says that he where he says, "Father, into your hands I commend my spirit." Literally what the Greek text says is, "Father, I'm coming home. I'm coming to you." And it indicates in the text that he bowed his head and died. Bowed his head and gave up the ghost. But something that I found very interesting a few years ago when I was doing a study of the crucifixion, the Greek term that is translated bowed his head would be better translated he pillowed his head. When Jesus died, even though it was a terrible thing going on around him, it was peaceful when he died. He was able to take his final breath in peace because he knew God was with him. He knew that he was about to cross his Jordan and go to be with his heavenly father. No matter how traumatic, no matter how painful the situation may be, a Christian is able to have peace in those situations. Because we know that God is with us. We know that we are following our divinely chosen leader. And that by doing so, he will lead us to our promised land. He will lead us to heaven. So yes, in conclusion, the Jordan River is the most famous river in the world for a number of reasons, but none more so 
than its connection to our faith. We see so many different ways that it plays such a major part. Maybe not necessarily as a literal river, but in the symbolism that it holds. It means so much to our faith. And I hope that this lesson has been one that has been instructive. I hope that you've learned something uh, about the Jordan River, but I hope it's also been inspirational to you. And I hope that if there's anyone here tonight that has never done as Jesus did and been plunged under the waters of baptism to have your sins taken away, that you will follow your leader's example tonight. That you will take that step. That you will plunge yourself into this symbolic Jordan. You know, another story that if we had time that we could talk about would be Naaman the Syrian. And how he was told that if he would go and he would dip in the Jordan seven times. From our study on Wednesday night of Revelation, we know the number seven is a sign of divine perfection. He was told, you go dip in the Jordan seven times and you will be completely healed of your leprosy. In that we see another type of our baptism. Our Heavenly Father has told us that if we will be washed in the waters of baptism that our spiritual life will be purified, will be cleansed. But we have to be willing to take that step. Tonight, if you're not a child of God, we encourage you, if you have faith that Jesus is the Son of God, to make a decision tonight. You're going to turn away from the things of this world. Just as those in the wilderness had made their decision that they were not going to stand with God and they lost their life, Still lost in the wilderness. Don't lose your life lost in the wilderness of this world. Make a decision tonight that you're going to follow God's way. The way set forth by His chosen leader, Jesus Christ, His Son. Come forward, confess that you believe that Jesus is God's Son and be baptized. Be washed clean in the waters of baptism. Be raised to walk in newness of life. Or if you are a child of God and you've allowed your life to become muddied up again by sin, then we encourage you to repent of those sins. Come forward and let us go to the Heavenly Father in prayer on your behalf. Be restored to the faith. Remove those sins from your life. Come back to following that divine leader. We want to go to that promised land. The Israelites, they waited 40 years to enter into their promised land. But each and every one of us, we have the ability to leave this place tonight knowing that we will get to enter our promised land. That heaven will be our home if we leave this place tonight in a right relationship with God. If you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come at this time while together we stand and sing.